Well, welcome. My name is Bill, and I had the honor of kicking off a series that we're beginning on the Minor Prophets. Think of the Minor Prophets. How many people know some of the names of the Minor Prophets? Sneezy, Doc, Happy, right? The Minor. No. Okay, the reason they're called the Minor Prophets is uh, actually because of the length of the books. We have the three major ones, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah. They're some of the largest books of, of the Bible. Uh, minor is simply not due to importance or significance, but it simply has to do with length. Why is 1 John first? Because it's longer than 2 John, which is longer than 3 John. We have no idea what order these books were in it. No idea. First and Second Thessalonians, nobody knows. But it's, they're just ordered that way because of length. And so Bible tends to just, you know, stick things in the, where they'll fit. And that's why we have the minor prophets, 12 of them. But what are the minor prophets? Minor prophets are a way that God gets up close and personal with his people, and he speaks in ways that they understand. It's a way of entering into their world and communicating something that, they just haven't been getting, haven't been seeing it, and doing it in very dramatic, very poignant ways. Um, it's, it's like in the old movies, uh, like a safe cracker. You'd, you'd get sandpaper, and you'd file down your fingerprints. That way, when you're doing the tumblers, you could feel, feel them. Anyone do that? Totally, it totally works. Seriously, try it. I just know that somehow. But it, it totally works. What um, the minor prophets are, are somebody with their soul sanded down that they can feel the undulations of God, that they can feel the effects of sin, of, of trust. Of they, they, they're just, they, they run higher and lower. They're kind of God's bipolar um, people because when, when things are magnified and up, they're uber magnified. When things are down, they're uber down. And, and it's a sense of they're following the contours of God's heart even though God's people at the time had gotten so insulated they couldn't feel anything. And so prophets are kind of this counterbalance, this reminder. And it's a way that God speaks to us, like, like I said, with the volume turned up. Now, there's another section of Scripture called the, the writings, and in particular, the Psalms. The Psalms are our cries to God. All seasons of life, happiness and sorrow and grief and anger and, and, and um, doubt and fear and all of these things, it's we're crying out to God. And, and what I found is helpful, um, there's three buckets that you can put all the Psalms into. One of the buckets are Psalms of Orientation. This is the way it is, and I'm just going with it. Then there's psalms of uh, disorientation. I thought I knew what was going on. Something horrible happened. I have no idea which ends up. And then psalms of reorientation. Now that the storm has passed, my life has been shaken, I'm putting the pieces back together, and this is how I know God better. This is how I know myself more, how I know others, the way things work. And, and that's the really in good and bad and all of that, us crying out to God, us saying, it's not fair, and why, and you promised, and I thought, and you said, and the Bible gives us space to do that. We can get in God's face, and it's, God's perfectly okay with it. He's a big boy, really. Um, the minor prophets are the opposite of that. The minor prophets are God's cry to us, where he can personify how he really feels about us, that as much as we tend to, we're about control and safety and security, and I want to know what to do so I can do it, so I can control, so I can feel safe, he's all about really saying, really? You're saying that. You're talking good game, but where you actually live are all these other areas. Let me live in one of those areas with you, and let's do life and talk about it. So that's what the minor prophets are. They teach us about uh, the use and abuse of power. They teach us about social justice. They teach us about uh, being used and abused. They, they teach us about um, overlooking those nearest us. Uh, so many habits of the heart that are very easy to do. I mean, when reading the minor prophets, you think, man, people were doing horrible things. No. It was a life just like the life in which we find ourselves. But just like today, the people had grown accustomed to it. It was the frog in the, the boiling water. You know, the difference between a rut and a grave is what? Six feet. Yeah. And, and so the, the people's rut had become a grave, and this is the way it was just knowledge of God, we check the right boxes, we say the right things, and now we deal with the rest of our life. And what Hosea, the first one, is going to tell us is that God is feeling very, very differently about this. Last time I spoke was Mother's Day, and I believe the topic I chose for Mother's Day was family, family ritual sacrifice, genocide, and prostitution. So in equal, you know, equal opportunity, I didn't want the guys to feel kind of short shrifted. Now, I didn't, you have to blame God, because I wasn't dealing up the minor prophets back, you know, 90 AD when these things were being put together. Um, first minor prophet is Hosea, and the topic is prostitution. So gentlemen, you are welcome. Remember uh, my dad. 
did a lot of crazy things, a lot of wonderful things together. And uh, one of the times that it was an opportunity for me to see way beyond the man that I thought I was, uh, was when I was 16 and we're on a lake herding ducks. Now, the reason we're out on a lake herding ducks is because um, six months earlier, our house had exploded, burned up as a propane explosion. There was just a smoking crater a week later. Lost everything overnight, instantly. Um, my father was the commander of this cold weather training base. It's uh, Pickle Meadows, it's two hours south of here, um, over Sonora Pass, gotta love it. Um, and they couldn't get rid of them, so they put us in a condemned officer's club. Hadn't been uh, used by anyone for 30 years. And so I had quarter-inch plywood walls, and I'd wake up with snow on my bed, same temperature in this out. We lived literally with raccoons and pack rats and bats, um, all sorts of good stuff. So, like, when I went to Siberia as a missionary, I'm like, it's nothing like California. I mean, <laughs> it's a child's play, what? Siberia. So anyway, um, one of the things we inherited with this officer's club was a lake, and on the lake were all the ducks that were kind of the mascot of the uh, base. And so the ducks were great and low maintenance, but in the winter, the lake would freeze over, and then this raccoon was coming out and taking a duck about every other day. This enormously rotund raccoon was eating well. And so the, because this, these were the mascots, and they didn't want them eaten, uh, base engineering put together this duck hutch, and so every single night, my dad and I would get brooms, and we'd go out there, and we'd herd ducks who got to be the most stupid creatures. I, I think I, God should have used, compared us to ducks rather than sheep. Now, I know sheep are stupid, but ducks, I mean, that would have been a better comparison. These guys, were, it was a nightmare. And we'd be out there for hours playing duck hockey or trying to, but these ducks, I mean, anyway. So we're, we're, we're there one night, and my dad had his full uniform and everything on, and I'm like 118 pounds sopping wet at the time. And um, I'm walking across the ice, and I'm standing there in the middle, and I'm going, man, this ice sounds, seems pretty solid. I'm not hearing any cracks or anything. And then I just dropped right through the ice. Um, and I dropped through it up to my neck. And it was about minus 20 um, air temperature. And I was wearing down, so I had about two seconds. And I couldn't even get a single syllable out. I, I just... <laughs> I, I couldn't, my per lungs were paralyzed. And so my dad lay down on the ice, and he, he taught the whole survival thing. So he, he went out and got a branch and kind of pulled me out and turned me around. And I, I mean, just, I'm paralyzed, I'm frozen. Um, I couldn't even grip onto anything. I, I, I could only use my, my arms. Terrifying. And, uh, and I'm just there shaking, and he finally got me out, and you know, he's getting me in and, and doing antihypothermia stuff. I get inside, shower, change, warm clothes. I mean, it's a close call. Like, oh my God, I almost died. This is terrifying. I look out the window, my dad is still chasing ducks over an hour and a half later. I'm feeling terrible. I'm like all warm and dry, and he's out there. He's been had this whole time. So I get new clothes, um, warm clothes, everything. I go out. I take about five steps. I drop right through the ice again. Oh. What a tool, right? Um, so my dad's got to lay down and go. Anyway, he got me out, and I dropped through further this time. And I, I could, just tried to get up, and I, I couldn't. It was really bad. Um, anyway, that night, I remember my dad saying, man, I never, yeah, I thought I was going to lose you. And I never knew how much he meant to me. I mean, I always knew, but I didn't know how much I knew. Because what I had heard, and, and he just said this humorously, but what, what I'd heard is he became a father, and he said, I remember you had colic really badly. And so your mom would hold you, I would hold you, and we'd just be kind of passing you back and forth. And I was sitting there looking at God going, and it's going to be like this every day for the rest of my life. Well, it wasn't. I have a younger sister. But, but the point is, um, the, the point is, uh, rather than just a collection of all these memories and moments and whatnot and thinking what fatherhood was as a category, and that was his approach going into it, he knew what being a father and having a son was when, when he almost lost me. And I could say I played that out with my kids uh, so many times. And the big lesson of Hosea and the big lesson that we're going to look at is love always costs more. Love always costs more. Because love's not a category. Love is not just a box. Love is not something that we can control and keep safe and protect and, and, and guide and manipulate. Love is a surrender. Love makes us vulnerable. Love is very, very risky. And love can be very, very damaging. Ever heard the phrase, a parent is only as happy as their saddest child? You guys hear that? Do, do, do you think it's true? A parent is only as happy as their saddest child. I think it is. 
See, there's a difference between happiness and joy. Joy is internal. Joy is irrespective of the circumstances. There is a transcendence beyond what I know, beyond what I can do, what I can't do, that gives me hope, that says it's going to be okay. I trust in a person. I don't know what, I don't know how, I don't know when, I I might even know why, but I know who, and that's enough. That's joy. That's a connection. Um, Happiness is when things are up, I'm up, and things are down, I'm down. The problem with happiness is you can't control it. 90% of your life is way out of your hands, whether you're a business owner, whether you're in a relationship, whether you're in a family. You can't even choose your family, right? Um, One of the great injustices of life. All all of these things, out of our control. And that's where happiness comes from. And and so there's this sense of, oh, Christians should always be happy. No, they shouldn't. You're on drugs if you're happy. I mean, give me some, because it must be pretty good, because there's a lot of reasons not to be happy. Happiness is a response to the circumstances around us. Being joyful is connected. So we can grieve while being joyful. Okay, but we can't do it the other way around. And so what I want to look at is God's side of the Hosea equation, how God reveals himself to us in very messy ways. What does God feel? Okay, a parent is only as happy as the saddest child. When you are God's saddest child, sure, he's joy. He's perfect relationship in and of himself. That, that's perfect. But circumstantially, because he cares, because he loves you, he's not happy. He's grieved. He's sad. There's something missing out. There's something that could be so much more. And so God is all about coming near, coming close, showing us more, forgiving us yet again, washing us clean, making us whole. He's in. He's committed. He's in motion. You see, the context of Hosea was people had a very static faith. People thought it was about, well, I said this prayer at camp. I, 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 I prayed the sinner's prayer. Remember the one in the Bible? Wait, that sinner's prayer is not in the Bible, is it? Is it? It's, no, it isn't, huh? I wonder why we make everyone say that. I don't know. Anyway, point is, um, so they thought they prayed the sinner's prayer. They believed the right things. They had orthodox theology. They had 612 laws. God was there. And as long as they did it okay, it was okay. But guess what? It was never okay because we were never made for that. We weren't made for just believing the right things and moving on with life. God put the desires for transcendence, for pleasure, for joy, for connection, for for vulnerability, for intimacy. He put those desires within us. And the problem is not finding those satisfiable. We all go sideways in so many different places to get those things met. Old Testament calls it idolatry. Another name Old Testament uses is adultery or, or promiscuity. He's saying this is the one thing that completes and does you, but these are other, all the other relationships in which you find yourself. And that's what the people were doing. They thought, well, it's just a, much, it's just a matter of showing up at church, praying more, reading your Bible, Bible, being a better person. But we were never made for that. And so everyone was living all these other transactions in terms of getting their needs met. And they're giving lip service to God, and they were dying on the inside and they didn't realize it. And so Hosea steps into the scene and says, guys, let me show you how messed up this really is. Let me speak your language. You guys are coloring outside the lines? Okay, I'm gonna command my holy prophet to do the same. Belief costs nothing. Trust costs everything. Believing facts, check in a box, that's nothing. James 2.19 says, you believe that God is one, i.e., you have correct theology. The demons also believe and they shudder. So you could have all the right answers and still not know God, right? So how tightly do we hold on to our beliefs? Beliefs are important, but are they primary? Belief costs nothing. Trust costs everything. See, belief is just, this is what I think about the world, and I'll amend it if I need to. Trust is I trust in a person, and I have expectations of a person, and I'm following hard after somebody, and I want to know that person, and I want to know more about that person. I want to know what's causing me not to know this person. Trust is emotion. Trust is a come follow me. Belief, that's static. That's about I want to control this. See, in most languages of the world, belief, faith, and trust are the same word. But we have these nuances in English where we think our faith in God is boiled down to just thoughts, and it isn't anything like that. And if we just make it that way, we go sideways. And that's what was happening in, in Hosea's time. And so God steps in. First thing we see, when the holy, almighty, completely other, exalted, heavenly, Lord God, get the point, began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go and marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. You see, people thought as long as they're holy prophet, they're professional, as long as he was keeping, you know, within bounds, everything was fine. Oh, the holy prophet is holy. Holy God is with his holy people. I can do whatever I want. 
But now they see the holy prophet command it to marry her? I was just with her last night. Oh, and I had her last week. And wait a minute. Wait, no, wait, God, you can't be doing what I do and don't tell you about that. Wait, this is weird. This is uncomfortable. This can't be. And this is God stepping near saying, this is what it's like. But I'm gonna show you even more. I'm gonna show you my broken heart over what you're really doing. And so command it to marry an unfaithful, um, this, this promiscuous woman. It's a really, really unfortunate um, situation when we get into modern technology when my youngest daughter has to explain to my mom the difference between a booty call and butt dialing. No, 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 grandma, you didn't just give me a booty call. You butt dialed me. Well, what's the difference? What's the difference? I... Okay. So, so Gomer, she was the first one. She was the first one. And that's how everybody saw her. And most tragically, that's the only way she saw herself. She was the late night booty dial. And that's all she was good enough for and all she could be known by. She was waiting for the next bus and that's the only bus she could hope for. Somebody that needed her then, not ultimately, needed her next, not completely. Somebody that needed a part of her, not her. Wash her and repeat. And so people were still trying to get their mind around. The holy prophet of God married to this person. She had three children already from, from this party lifestyle, being used and abused and trying to make the best of it. And now there's three, they, they have three kids of their own, the holy prophet of God and the, this, this promiscuous woman. And so their first kid's given a name, and everyone's waiting. Oh, boy, what's he going to name the prophet? What's the prophet going to name his son? Because it's going to be good stuff for us. It's going to be good stuff for us. And so it's going to be Israel is my favorite. Israel's awesome. Israel's going to win. Um, Jews are, just keep doing it the way, yeah, Bill, go for it. What, whatever. It's something stupid. I, I wish I had more time to think about this. And um, so they're waiting for the name, and he gives the name Jezreel. And they're like, ooh. Why'd you have to go there? See, Jezreel was a place where um, Ahab and uh, Jezebel, these horrible kings that were leading them astray, were stopped. And the next day, 70 people showed up beheaded. Well, they didn't show up. I guess they were brought there because if they're beheaded, they wouldn't. You, you know what I'm saying? It, it was a horrible tragedy that took place. Now, 70 decapitated people would be like Tuesday in Las Vegas country or, or Ramallah. But now, here in America, 70 decapitations would be pretty big. And the people took it all in stride. See, these were 70 government officials of the corrupt previous administration. And so people were like, all right, God delivered us from this evil king. Let's take matters into our own hands. It's payback time. And so 70 people died. And God's saying, not only was this horrible tragedy uh, visited on my people, but nobody even cared. And so God's saying, no, it's not okay. No, you can't do whatever you want. No, life, life absolutely matters even more for you as my people, not less. And so we reminded him of their past. It would be like taking a really patriotic person and naming their kid Hiroshima or Sioux Nation Genocide, or Abu Ghraib. That's, that's messed up, God. Why do you got to go there? Because he's saying it is messed up, and you never went there. Next time they had a child, and they named it Lo Ruma, not loved. They said, God loves me, so I can do whatever I want. Is that true? Depends what you mean. See, if, love, if, if, if faith is just a matter of belief, I believe that Jesus died to take my sins. He did so past, present, and future. He did so outside of time. Therefore, I'm forgiven of all my sins, past, present, and future. That means any sin that I do commit has already been forgiven, which means I can do whatever I want get to heaven. Isn't that the gospel? Isn't it? It is absolutely the gospel, but it's told from the wrong vantage point. It's what can I get away with? What can I do the most of? See, the gospel is I was living my life torn apart from my creator. Everything I did was destined for ruin and destruction of myself and others. And the bits of love that I was chasing was destroying me and destroying others. I wasn't meant for that. God graciously came down into my mess and he saved me that I could know better, I could love better, I could live a life of hope. And this God who has loved me more than anyone or anything, when he's seen me at my worst and given me his best, if I would now know going, go and willingly sin just so I can get away with it, rather than knowing the pain that that's gonna bring him, in what sense do I know what love is? See, people were saying that we're loved because we believe the right thoughts about our theology. And God's saying, look, if you're not loving, if you're not love-ed, if, if you're not feeling love, if you're not being transformed by love, if people aren't seeing me in you, then no, you're not loved. Loving is not just about a category. It's not being the right people. 
Loving is about a dynamic emotion, a come follow me. And so he calls him out and he says, no, you're not loved. And then the final son is uh, named uh, Lokami, which means you're not my people. They always said, but we're the people of God. We're impervious. We're the people of God. The, the other rules, the rules that apply to other people don't apply to us. And he said, no, they all absolutely do, but I've taken care of it. You are not my people if you don't know me in relationship. It's not about right belief. It's not about right faith. So now it gets really messy because not just enough of these three shocking names, not just enough that he married this woman uh, and, and God's holy prophet is hanging out with everybody's favorite booty call, to be quite crude, and that's the way they saw it. But now she continued and he continued. She continued to chase after all the false images of herself, seen in all these lovers and all these promises and all this attention. So every single night, the same tragic story would play out, where, where Hosea would be cold, perhaps a draft, maybe a door left open, and he'd reach around for his wife. And where his warm wife used to be, it was now a cold spot in the bed. He'd hear the carousing, he'd hear all the yelling, he'd hear the laughter, he'd hear the singing and all the drunken sounds going on. And at night, he'd come and pull his wife out of the street. She'd been used, abused, and left. Clean up all the mud, clean up all the abuse, give her new clothes, bind her wounds, tell her how much he loved her, tell her how special she was. Wash her and repeat, repeat that night again. And he knew the next night would be the same, and he knew the next night would be the same. And so the people saw Hosea's heart being broken over and over. He really did love her. He really did know that it could be so much better for her. He really did know that her greatest need could be met in him and not in all these other people that laughed about her and bragged about her and, and put videos up online and made crude jokes about her and could care less about her. And God said, this is you and me. You see, you think all these other ways of establishing yourself or completing yourself or whatever is going to do it for you, but they use you, abuse you, and as soon as the need's met, be it a person, be it a thing, be it an entity. See, idols always demand greater sacrifice, right? As soon as they're done using you, you're, you're back with yourself alone. And God's saying, I am the one. So God displayed himself to his people, but he didn't display himself in power. He didn't display himself in glory. He didn't display himself in an awe-inspiring way where people just drop, drop to the ground and start worshiping. He displayed him in the way that they understood because it's where they lived, as a chump, as a cuckold, as a meal ticket, as a sucker. See, a cuckold comes from a male cuckoo. Cuckoos lay, not the male, but the female, lays their eggs in other birds' nests so they raise their, their young. And it's used derisively of a husband of an unfaithful spouse. So God displays himself in the most humiliating, most shameful, most embarrassing way possible. This is God in the story because this is his heart of love, irrespective of being laughed at, of being misunderstood, of being hated, of being a derision, irrespective of the blindness and not being seen as the meter of all the needs, irrespective of people not understanding, only seeing a glimpse of Hosea's heart, but through the tear-stained eyes of the prophet, we see God saying, this is how I feel about you. This is what faith is and what it isn't. Secondly, am I in two or three? We, we working with here, two? Should I restack these? If knowledge isn't intimate, it insulates. Okay? If knowledge isn't intimate, it insulates. Okay, the people had the right answer. So they saw this and they're like, oh my gosh, God, you're right. Yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not wholehearted. Uh, we're, we're playing games with you. We're so sorry. And so they just pray this great prayer found in verses uh, one through three in chapter six. Come, let us return to the Lord for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down that he will bind us up. Oh, you got us, God. You called us out. You, after two days, he'll revive us. On the third day, he'll raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord His going out as sure as the dawn and he will come to us as the showers, the springing rains, that water, the earth, and everything's going to be hunky dory because he's our God and he's faithful. Um, these are all prayers in the Bible, and they're just on autopilot. They're the right prayers. They're absolutely the right prayers, but they're at the wrong time. They're saying, okay, God, we're, my bad. We'll just go back to this category of believing the right thoughts. And God's going, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the opposite of that. You're insulated with this knowledge. You think if you can just believe and control, that's going to be enough. And I'm going to take that away. Um, 
Let me give you an example of that. Number seven in scripture. How many people know what the number seven means in the Bible? Anyone? Perfection? Completion? Anyone else? Number seven. Sabbath, Sabbath? Sabbath? yeah. You can, if you've been in church anywhere and you hear the number seven come up, run, because you're probably trapped in a Bible study in Revelation and it's gonna end badly. So <laughs> get, get while the getting's good. Pick your friends and leave early. Get the good grillers, whatever. Um, yeah, number seven, you always hear it's God's number of perfection. God's number of perfection. Where do we hear that from? Bible studies. I taught it. I taught a course on Revelation last, um, last couple months ago. I taught this. I was totally wrong. I was looking for this. It doesn't come from anywhere. We just made it up. We just made it up. This is knowledge, and this is the number seven. It's God's number of completion. When you seven, it's perfect number, and the sevenfold spirits of God, and all this. And so we have this grid of this is how I do theology. I have an understanding of this teaching. Turns out the teaching doesn't even come from the Bible. It doesn't come from history. There's no ancient history of Egypt or of uh, um, ancient Near East and Israel that said seven was a perfect number. Other, other civilizations have had eight and four and two and five and other numbers, ten. Nobody seven, not the Israelites. We just made that up because we couldn't come up with an answer, and we just teach it. Seven is the number of perfection. I can tell you why seven's in the Bible. It's release. See, every sevens, there's a release. There's a release from work, a Sabbath, that you'll give it back to God. You give your time. You give your energy. You'll give your rest. You receive from him. And so there's a rhythm that that's on the sixth day, there'll be, the last day of the week, there'll be a rest. Um, seven years would be a jubilee, that there'd be a release. There'd be a release um, from uh, captivity. All slaves would be released every seven years. Um, every seven times seven, uh, 79 or 49, they round it to 50, would be a jubilee year. That would be all debts would be forgiven. All land would be returned to its uh, original owner. All, all, all slaves that year would be released. It'd be a jubilee of jubilees. Okay, so there's this rhythm of walking in release, forgiveness, returning, okay? That's how it was set up. Now, when Daniel was seeking to know when the um, exile would be uh, come to an end, because he knew the 70 years, he's inquiring, and God tells him, no, the exile will be for 70 years, but the true return will be in a jubilee of jubilee of jubilees, seven times the seven times of jubilees, so seven times 70 or 490 years. Israel returned after 70 years, but that 490 from Daniel, that's the exact time up to the day of Christ's birth. So he's saying the real jubilee of jubilees, the real release would be Christ. Okay, now, the next time we come to seven is when Peter is asking Jesus, how many times must, must me forgive somebody? And he's saying, well, I've got my theology, and seven's God's number of perfection, so if I just forgive him once, I'm perfectly justified in punching him the next time, right? And what's the response? Even if your brother sins seven times 70, Jesus isn't going, well, gee, you're a fisherman. You don't know very big numbers, so I'm going to count up to, ooh, 70, Peter. That's a huge number for a fisherman. Can you imagine such a tall number? 70 times 7. Ooh, he's not, he's not talking like that. I hope nobody is. But um, <laughs> what, what he's saying is your, your question's wrong. You want to control this with information. Your question is 7 is walking in jubilee. My arrival was the Jubilee of Jubilees. I am the Jubilee. If you are to do as I do, then every single time one sins, you must release, release, release. Because it's not a theology of X number of times, and this is when I forgive and when I don't. That's a static theology. I have knowledge I control, perfect number seven. But it is, this is the function of it to show us a rhythm of life, a rhythm of release in every area culminating in who Christ is. And now every, every point of life that Christ touches is how do I walk in Jubilee? Jubilee in forgiveness, in release, in freedom. Do you see the difference between a dynamic and a static philosophy and what's going on? So God responds this way. Verse 4, chapter 6. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judas? Their childhood names. Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Therefore, I have hewn them by my prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. Now, they'd used this language before, but they're different Hebrew words that are being used here. When, what's translated to, to keep it similar, but what God is saying is, no, you felt like I was hurting you with my words. I've hewn you. I've cut you with my prophets. But the word is, I have restored I have set in place. I've had to re-break the bones that they would set correctly. And so he's saying, even though you received it as painful, I did what was right. My judgment goes forth as the light. 
but how does God lead? For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. See, all the time, the, every time the Pharisees were saying, no, Jesus, you're not doing it right, you don't fit in our box, that's religion, Jesus quoted this exact verse to them. And you see, remember what was the, the, the thing that people struggled with, being Pharisees like you guys? What did God say to them? That's what I'm saying to you. I desire faithfulness, loving kindness, not sacrifice. What you can give up for me, I don't care. I don't need that. But it's going to clear your heart out so we can do this, and that's greatly what I desire. So if this leads to more intimacy, yeah, that's great. But if it doesn't, what does that profit you? He said, go and desire what this means. I desire love. That word love is the word chesed. The word chesed, which is... um, It's been translated a lot of different ways. Uh, Last week we read, the love of the Lord endures forever in Psalm 136. It's the word chesed, and it means loyal, faithful, compassionate, steadfast, there to the end, believing all things, hoping all things, enduring all things, bearing all things. You get that 1 Corinthians 13 vibe? No word can describe this, but this is how God rolls. This is where he is. He's not a static God. He's a God that says, come follow me. And so this chesed is a way of being, a way of doing, a way of engaging and making a difference, not a set category of having the right answer. I don't want your faithfulness. I don't want you to pray more and to try harder and to smell right and to act like a Christian. I want you to engage in the rough areas of your life where we can do this together and the people around you, they can't help but see me. Brings us to our final point. Love doesn't make us safe. It makes us dangerous. What was Gomer's greatest need? If you, were, if you were in that situation, what would you want, Gomer? How would you want the story to be written? I don't know how you would, you would write it, but an element that would absolutely need to be there was her protection, her security wasn't going to come by changing the situation because there's always going to be some player, some liar, some user, some lover that's going to come across her life. There's always going to be somebody hitting on the old insecurities, hitting on the old weaknesses, hitting on their own doubts. If things had squared away between maybe she's decided, okay, too much, too, it's, this is too costly, I'm just going to, I guess he's an okay guy, I'm going to stay with him. Is that, gonna, is that the relationship that she just stops this behavior? Let me put it this way. What's going to make all the difference in my daughter's life in, in who they marry, and my son as well, but, but I'll, I'll use my daughters, um, isn't me telling the right way for them to be or saying these are the standards that you need to have or, or this is the value system that you need to have. The greatest worship song in the world is not going to keep her out of the back seat of a car. But what's going to make her not safe but dangerous is when she sees herself as God sees her that she is precious, beautiful, whole, perfect, desirable, desired, loved, here for a purpose, in gifted. God is enraptured with her. God wants to live his life through her at every point, passionately, intimately use everything. And there's gonna be so many pretenders and imposters that wanna pretend and to play a much lesser role. And when she can see herself as that precious and that loved and that, and that front and center and that God and all of heaven leaning down and God walking with her, that's going to make her dangerous. I don't have to worry about these other clowns. But as long as she is still believing that what other people think about me and, and my own insecurities that I have to cover up and my own shame that I have to hide and the fears that, that I have to, that have to keep uh, cloaked with, with performance and all these other things, it's just this horizontal thing where we're playing games and it's just a shell game. And that's what God wanted to tell his people. He's saying, look, what's going to make you, I don't want to make you safe. I don't want to make it essential no matter how big, bad, and scary it gets out there or how, how weak and insecure or frail we may feel in here. I'm going to be around you and it's going to be okay. God never said that. He didn't say, let's come here and sing Kumbaya and sit down and not move. He said, come follow me. Come follow me. Another example of knowledge being static versus knowledge being dynamic For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have, what? Everlasting life, eternal life, live forever. You guys believe that? Do you guys believe you have eternal life? There's one problem with that verse. And everywhere else 
that verse is used and translated in the New Testament. It nowhere says eternal life. It doesn't say eternal life. It says life of the age. And whoever believes in me will not perish, but will have life of the age. See, the Jews believed in two ages. There was the life of the present age, and the present age is jacked up and it's messed up. Nobody needs to tell you that. It's just left to us to creatively discover all the ways in which it's fallen and messed up because we discover all the ways in which we're fallen and messed up. So that's this age. But then God's going to do something. He's going to do something, and he's going to take care of it, and the Jews saw from afar, and whatever he's going to do, he's going to do. And then it would be the new age of righteousness and the, the wonderful counselor and all that time. We have a bit more of a focus on what God has done in Christ. But when Jesus said, this day has been fulfilled in your presence, truly this generation will not pass away, will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God coming in power. He wasn't talking about the second coming. He was talking about us participating in the very kingdom of God. He was talking about a dynamic relationship. When we follow him, we are experiencing the age to come. We're able to forgive as he forgives, bind as he binds. Pray as he prays, love as he loves, be vulnerable as he is vulnerable, weak and strong at the same time. That is a dynamic faith, that is a real faith. If we think about it as, I believe these facts and I have the right theology and I said a prayer in camp and I'm gonna live forever and here's my ticket to heaven, we're gonna have a hard time finding that verse in the Bible. Wait a minute, Bill, are you saying we don't have eternal life? Jesus said, come follow me. Do we follow him because of a promise we're going to live forever? Is that why we follow him? Do we promise because he made it all better when we really needed it? Why do we follow him? Now, I'm not saying we don't live forever, but the verses of eternal life do not mean that at all. It's not something that we receive because we believe the right things hard enough and long enough. It is something we are able to experience right here and right now at every point in which I surrender and follow God. Do do you know the two two feet walking along the shore? That that one? Isn't that horrible? I was going to say awesome, but I I saw some of you going like this, and I just had to pull. Um, Because Jesus didn't say, hey, I'm going to follow you. Hey, where are you going, Bill? Really? You're wasting all this time? All this time? You're just wasting this time? Okay, I'm going to follow you. That's cool. Hey, we're going to Sinville? Cool. Let's just hang out in Sintown for a while. That's awesome. Are you going to waste more time here? Great. Are you going to hurt some people? Sweet. I, Lord of the universe, I didn't have anything to do. I'm just going to follow you around. This is great. Oh, here we are on the beach. Oh, you know, I'm going to carry you now. I'm going to set you back down. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to follow you. He said, you come follow me. Where I'm going matters. Where I'm going is the way of life. Where I'm going is the jubilee of jubilees. Where I'm going is walking in release and walking in hope and walking in faith. Where I'm going requires a real person to show up who really is hurting and really is broken and really is confronted with and conflicted by all the other imposter lovers that can meet the real need now when this confounding God doesn't show up. And now that's the tension where a real God has to show up. That's the kind of faith that God is talking about. Faith that makes us dangerous rather than safe. So how do you see God this morning? Do you see a God that puts up with, with you for utility? Maybe you got other family members and you're just kind of a bonus and you're just along for the ride. Um, you know, you're basically okay and yeah, you got kind of, you know, rolls his eyes sometime, but you're in. Or begrudgingly offering yet another chance for you not to embarrass him. Do you see God is giving more rope to hang yourself? He gives me enough rope where I make a hammock before I make a noose. Um, do you see God as being all about his glory? It's all about the glory of God. It's the glory of God. It's all about the glory of God. You pour yourself as a drink offering and you just give it all and you lay it down. And he's not going to take it up. You put it back down again. You lay it down. And you pour yourself out and it's all for the glory of God. Do you see God running his car on your gasoline? It's not God. You see God that has all these hidden expectations that you somehow fail to meet? Or maybe these revealed expectations you know you haven't met? You see, these were all the ways that the people of Hosea's time saw God. That there's a God they couldn't measure up to, didn't want to follow, didn't really like, wasn't really there, wasn't following them around in their mess. But when they opened their eyes to see the God who was really there, not just 
I gotta be with you kind of thing, but I'm passionately coming after you, getting my fingernails dirty, bloodied, whatever it takes to come near you because I love you, and I'll do it again, 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 and I'll look like a chump, and I'll look like a sucker, and people will laugh, people will be embarrassed. I'm not afraid to be put to shame. I'm not afraid to be, have people think outrageous things. I'm not afraid whatever because I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you, I love you, and I will not broach any other imposters. When we can see that God, and that's the God who sees us, and that's the God that loves us, and that all of this makes a difference, all of our mistakes, the little ones, the big ones, everything is an opportunity to tear down the false images of God that we have. And in that sensitivity and vulnerability, allow the God who is near, who beckons us to follow him, who wants us to have more of a dynamic faith, can strengthen the needs that are weak, that we would be able to follow him. Do we see God as our maker who knows everything about us, feels everything in response? See, in the book of Hosea, God has displayed himself both as this cuckold, but also as an ancient parent, who ancient, anxious, ancient probably as well because of the anxiety, but pacing back and forth at a window and a teen hasn't come home. Oh my gosh, I knew I shouldn't have given him the car. Oh, I, I just, gosh, I'm so scared. I'm gonna kill him. I'm gonna hug him. I'm gonna cry and then I'm gonna kill him. No, I'm gonna smack him. I'm gonna hug him. I'm gonna smug him. I'm, you know, there, you, there's this sense of you don't know what to do. God, God displays himself that way. Or, or, or of a mother just having deja vu and just, just, just blubbering everything and sees a commercial. Ah! And she's like, oh, I remember when you were a baby and I taught you to walk and I, when I nurtured you and uh, all of this. And God just displays himself saying, I know you didn't see it, but I was there. I was all in, always, always, every single step of the way for you. And so you can follow me with confidence and faith. You can follow me knowing I'm going to be there for you. And you can know, follow me knowing that whatever you're holding onto, even if it's a control area of, I, I believe this, um, there is a joy and a peace of being able to walk in jubilee with the one who truly is jubilee. Let's pray. Father, man, you know our hearts. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. And we think we do it better. We think we, we do it better than the other generation. We've learned their lessons, but our hearts are just as deceived and frail, weak and dry and hurting. But you are just as compassionate and tender and desirous of a full life, not just a life of ascent, but a life of falling down, of getting up, of wrestling, of dancing, of, of being roughed up, a life where in, in whatever we had to overcome to lay a hold of you would be able to. I think of Jacob, who at the end of his life had to lean on his staff because holding on to you cost him. And would that be the case for me? Would that be the case for all of us? That we wrestled with you, we went to the mat, but God, I'm proud of these scars because they show the reality of your hold upon me, of your commitment, of your solidarity, of your grace, that I have the courage to, to follow hard after you. We thank you, Lord, that you are the ultimate, ultimate Father. We thank you, Father, that uh, you love us more than we could imagine. And I pray this Father's Day for all of us, all of us who've had a father, and even the best ones, a far cry from you, that you would help us to tear down what is from man, what is compensation, what is hurt, what is blindness, what, what are pains that we may have even been unaware of, and that you would put in the place who you are, drawing us deeper into your heart. In Christ's name we pray.